calves and sheep, we see uh, scours associated with F5 E. coli. Um, in calves, these receptors are only expressed in the first week of life. And the diarrhea tends to be watery, but not bloody. And colloquially, it's actually called white scours. In these young calves, polymicrobial infections are really, really common. So we can see a variety of viruses, parasites, and bacteria resulting in diarrhea. And there's a few interesting um, features of these infections that, from an ecological perspective, I think are worth mentioning. So rotavirus and cryptosporidium parvum are actually able to uncover F5 receptors in older calves. So not only those below one week of life, but older animals are potentially susceptible if they have an infection with one of these other organisms as well. Also in our young calves, we can see E. coli causing systemic infections or cholecystemia. Um, this is not uncommon in neonates, and these infections tend to be ascending from the umbilicus. Just like the image of a piglet, here we have the image of the back end of a calf with fecal staining along the tail, upper legs, and perineum, demonstrating how profuse the diarrhea was and the lack of blood associated with F5 E. coli infections in animals of this age group. Edema disease in pigs is caused by shigatoxin producing E. coli. This is a peracute disease, so oftentimes you're only going to find animals dead. On affected animals, you'll see edema of the eyelids, forehead, and on postmortem of the stomach and spiral colon. If you do happen to find these animals before they progress too far, neurological signs are likely to be present due to infarctions of the brain. Because of the edema that we can see in uh, the colon, this is an important differential diagnosis for Clostridioides difficile. These piglets are infected by the fecal oral route. Um, and once that bacteria makes its way into the gut, attaches to the epithelium, it produces the STX2E toxin, so one of the shiga toxins, and the pathology results from systemic toxin absorption. In this image here, you can see an edematous stomach uh, from a pig infected with one of these STX E. coli. What I wanted to point out here is the appearance of edematous tissue on uh, post-mortem. Here you can see where a cut is made, the tissue quickly separates. Those cut edges pull apart from each other because there's so much extra fluid in the interstitial space. The tissues appear to be sort of wet and glistening, which is all very characteristic uh, of edema. In people, shigatoxin-producing E. coli, colloquially known as hamburger disease, um, cause severe bloody diarrhea. Um, we see hemorrhagic colitis, potentially hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is where we get a hemolytic anemia, so the red blood cells are breaking down in the body, kidney failure, and thrombocytopenia. It's most commonly, at least in North America, associated with 0157H7 E. coli. So these are E. coli which possess the 157th somatic O antigen and the 7th flagellar H antigen. And this is a very important foodborne pathogen, most commonly associated with beef, although if we have cross-contamination of other foods, it can certainly occur in even plant-based products as well. Good food hygiene within the kitchen is really, really important. And so this little infographic from the FDA emphasizes the importance of cleaning surfaces, separating cooked from uncooked foods, ensuring that products reach an adequate temperature, and then ensuring that prepared products are kept cold. In addition to foodborne transmission, we can have direct transmission from an animal into a person via the fecal oral route. And this can occur either through contaminated water or even direct contact with animals. At the time of filming this lecture, health officials in Calgary, Alberta, Canada are investigating a large outbreak of shigatoxin producing E. coli among children in daycare centers. Um, at present, there's over 100 kids who have been affected, including many who are hospitalized and some with hemolytic uremic syndrome. I've put a link to a news article above so you can find out more about this uh, current issue that we're dealing with, with uh, shigatoxin producing E. coli. In the dairy industry, E. coli is also a really important cause of mastitis, and we would call that coliform mastitis. As an enteric organism, E. coli is shed in the feces, and we think that it enters the teats from the environment. 
presentation of affected cows varies from quite mild to very, very severe. Um, some cows are thought to respond very early to the invasion with E. coli and are able to clear it from the teat. Others respond quite a bit more slowly, allowing the organism to multiply and reach higher concentrations within the mammary gland. When it multiplies in the teat, we get the release of endotoxin from dead cells, uh, leading to a cytokine storm and systemic inflammation. So it's not only an issue of mastitis, but it can become a life-threatening infection. In fact, 30 to 40% of severely affected cows can become bacteremic, so they have the organism circulating through their bloodstream. Treatment of coliform mastitis relies on antimicrobials, both systemic and intramammary, and management factors, including removing organic bedding and other materials that support the growth of E. coli, is really important. In our poultry species, cholebacillosis is a huge challenge. Um, this causes a constellation of syndromes from omphalitis, cholecystemia, swollen head syndrome, and air sacculitis. Um, omphalitis uh, often also times involves the yolk sac. The pathogenesis of these infections presumably starts while the chick is still in the egg. So the E. coli makes its way through the egg. These are porous um, structures and is able to uh, start invading at that time. This organism is uh, widely disseminated in the environment as it's, of course, found in the hen's feces. So there's ample opportunities to contaminate uh, eggs. In some instances, these inovo infections can lead to exploding eggs. So gas produced by the bacteria can cause the egg to burst, and that then showers eggs in the nearby environment with bacteria perpetuating the infection. In this image here, we have an emu chick who died in ovo due to E. coli. You'll note the eggshell is black. This is actually normal for an emu and not associated with the infection itself. Omphalitis is associated with numerous presentations from simply dead embryos, swelling and edema of the navel or distended abdomen, or kind of mushy chicks that are born very, very sad where we have the body wall overlaying the yolk sac kind of degenerating and breaking down. Treatment of these infections is definitely controversial. Um, killing the bacteria requires antimicrobials, but given that we have many management strategies we can do to prevent these infections, it's controversial. We need to keep things clean, discarding floor eggs or those which explode, Remember, we want to prevent contamination of the egg surfaces as much as possible. Potentially disinfecting eggs within two hours of laying, although this can be a double-edged sword. We don't necessarily want to remove the protective cuticle surrounding the egg. And then providing good quality diets, um, making sure the chickens are as healthy as possible, and vaccinating them um, against other immunosuppressive uh, conditions. Next, I want to briefly discuss urinary tract infections in dogs. Um, UTIs are extremely common. They're estimated to affect approximately 14% of dogs at some point throughout their lifetime, most commonly spayed females. And E. coli is the most common cause of these infections, so over 50% of them. It's quite a bit less common in cats than dogs, so it's more something that we deal with in canine medicine. We can classify urinary tract infections based on their anatomical site. So a lower urinary tract infection would be of the bladder and urethra, while an upper UTI would be of the kidney and ureter. Within lower urinary tract infections, we can further subdivide and classify, um, sporadic cystitis being what's most common in otherwise healthy animals. And in this figure here, I've put in some of the criteria that define sporadic cystitis. So this is in female dogs. They're otherwise healthy, they're non-pregnant, and these are animals which have no other recognized abnormalities, no functional abnormalities, anatomical uh, abnormalities, or comorbidities which might predispose them to an infection. And sporadic cystitis is not a repeat event. This is something that happens infrequently. The reason that it's important to make these differentiations is that it greatly affects how we treat these animals. So 
if we have sporadic cystitis, so meeting all those criteria I just mentioned, we can treat these animals empirically. Um, of course, we do still want to collect urine to do culture and susceptibility testing, um, but empiric therapy is reasonable. If it's not sporadic cystitis, so if it's anything else, any other type of lower or certainly upper urinary tract infection, we must base therapy on susceptibility test results. Antibiotic therapy also varies quite importantly depending on the site of infection, so we'll handle an upper versus a lower urinary tract infection differently. We absolutely need to address the underlying disease, so you need to get a diagnosis. Why does this animal have a UTI? Is it an uncontrolled diabetic? Does it have a transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder? What is the underlying disease? Because without addressing that, the infections are just going to come back again and again and again. The animals will be treated with round after round of antimicrobials, will encourage antimicrobial resistance and all of the negative uh, impacts of that for both your patient and society more generally. So get a diagnosis. This is critically important. This is a screenshot of the ISCAD guidelines for the diagnosis and management of UTIs in dogs and cats. And it's a great resource for anybody who's going to be uh, working with companion animals as part of their scope of practice. There's a lot of excellent information here, and it is freely available online. So I would encourage all of you to take a look at this. Samples to collect. Well, we've talked about so many different types of syndromes. It's obviously going to depend on which disease we're talking about. So diarrhea, probably we aren't going to be doing cultures. Um, looking at uh, colonic tissue histopathologically is going to be really useful. If we have mastitis, we want to collect milk. If we have omphalitis, we'll collect samples from dead chicks, um, or we can send in the animal as a whole. If we have a mortality event in another population of animals, such as pigs, um, perhaps we'll send in whole animals to allow for a pathologist to identify both classical pathological lesions and also to collect uh, samples for culture and histology um, from relevant affected tissues. And then, of course, in the case of urinary tract infections, we want to aseptically collect urine by cystocentesis. This is really, really important. A free catch urine um, is just not as diagnostically uh, valuable. E. coli will be easily grown using our standard lab culture methodologies, and McConkie always provides a useful first clue. So we'll see those nice pink lactose fermenters. We can easily identify them biochemically using MALDI, using molecular tests. It's not a challenge to work with. There may be instances where we want to identify or differentiate uh, specific pathotypes or identify toxins, and nucleic acid amplification tests or PCR can be really useful for that. And then, of course, histology is important for identifying and characterizing lesions or identifying bacteria in situ at the site of infection. Zoonotic transmission of E. coli is very important. Um, foodborne transmission is perhaps the one that's top of mind. So particularly things like our enterohemorrhagic shigatoxin producing O157H7. Um, this is a strain which is maintained by healthy cattle and shed in the feces. Um, it doesn't cause any disease in cattle. So they actually lack the receptor for the shigatoxin. So it can't possibly um, hurt them, but it certainly can cause some very severe disease in us. And then other E. coli are potentially a source of antimicrobial resistance from animals. So in this figure here, what you can see are changes in the susceptibility of E. coli isolated from chickens over a five-year period from 2014 through 2018 in different regions of Canada. Um, similar surveillance programs are present in Europe, Australia, um, and the United States as well. Other E. coli, those which aren't foodborne, I think are less well-defined and less well-recognized. One of the issues that I see in recognizing these infections is that E. coli is so common that finding an E. coli infection in a person doesn't really raise any red flags or necessarily uh, trigger a disease investigation. So there could be transmission happening that we simply are failing to identify. 
Um, it's also something that probably goes in both directions. So we certainly have lots of opportunities to share organisms with our pets, um, whether it's through their food, them drinking out of the toilet, us kissing them, them licking our faces, them sleeping in bed with us, all great opportunities for an E. coli from our dog to make its way into us. But this transmission is probably bi-directional, and we probably also share E. coli with them as well. In a clinical context, I think E. coli is something that we can use standard precautions in order to prevent transmission, so good hand hygiene um, and personal protective equipment like lab coats and gloves. Antimicrobial resistance is a big problem in our enterobacteriales and E. coli specifically, and so treatment really must be guided by susceptibility testing. We know a lot about the intrinsic resistance of these organisms, and we can say that all enterobacteriales, including E. coli, are intrinsically resistant to benzyl penicillin. So this is our original penicillin, our glycopeptides, fusidic acid, most of our macrolides, lincosamides, streptogramins, and rifampin. Um, this is important to know because if you know you're dealing with an E. coli, you can rationally select an empiric therapy that is not one of these drugs. We're going to be talking about the specifics of intrinsic resistance for other species of enterobacteriales in our next lecture, so stay tuned for that. And then finally, as a general theme, I think it's important to know that resistance is emerging and that as future prescribers, you should be aware of broad-spectrum beta-lactamases, both our ESBLs or extended-spectrum beta-lactamases and carbapenemases, and also fluoroquinolone resistance. Plasmid-mediated fluoroquinolone resistance is oftentimes associated with ESBLs, um, and so we lose multiple important classes uh, for treating gram-negative infections. Got a bunch of new terms today, and then of course, as always, some questions for self-assessment.